since many of these attacks have been random. They've been on ships that have no connection to Israel. Uh, and in fact, last night, uh, after this first round of strikes, uh, the Houthis launched another missile at a ship in the Gulf of Aden. This was a ship carrying Russian oil, uh, Russia, which has denounced the American strikes, the British strikes on the Houthis. So uh, this campaign, despite the, the sort of protestations of the Houthis, this campaign has been a random one, and, and the Houthis are doing it in part to push their own domestic and regional interests, to boost their standing in the region, uh, and to give them perhaps a, a stronger domestic position in the ongoing civil war in Yemen. Now, the Houthis have said that there will be a strong and effective response to the strike. So let's speak to Greg Karlstrom, the economist uh, from The Economist, a Middle East correspondent. Uh, he joins me from Jerusalem. Uh, Greg, thanks for giving us your time. Thanks for having me. Can you take us through what we know about last night's attack and the reason behind the strike from the US? It was an extra strike from what I gather. It was, and this one was just an American strike, unlike the night before where British and American warplanes were involved. Uh, the Defense Department in America says this was an attack with Tomahawk cruise missiles. They attacked a radar station in Yemen. They were describing it as a follow-on attack to the first round of strikes on Thursday night. So. Uh, suggesting it may have been a target that uh, they meant to strike on Thursday and, and weren't able to. Uh, it seems that these are not just one-off then, uh, not just a one-off thing on Thursday night, that there might be more appetite to do follow-up strikes uh, in the United States. But I think the question for everyone in this international maritime coalition right now is just how far they're willing to go, how long they're willing to sustain a campaign of strikes in Yemen if it turns out that uh, these initial ones don't deter the Houthis from attacks on commercial shipping. Greg, what is this going to do with the conflict in uh, Gaza at the moment? Is it going to have a direct effect? I don't think it'll have a direct effect on the conflict. I mean, the Houthis have been saying since they started this campaign against shipping about two months ago that they are doing this in solidarity with and support of Palestinians of Gaza. And they have said that uh, they are only targeting ships that have links to Israel, either to Israeli firms or ships that are calling at Israeli ports. But if you look at what they've actually targeted over the past two months, many of these attacks have been random. They've been on ships that have no connection to Israel. Uh, and in fact, last night, uh, after this first round of strikes, uh, the Houthis launched another missile at a ship in the Gulf of Aden. This was a ship carrying Russian oil. Uh, Russia, which has denounced the American strikes, the British strikes on the Houthis. So uh, this campaign, despite the, the sort of protestations of the Houthis, this campaign has been a random one, and, and the Houthis are doing it in part to push their own domestic and regional interests, to boost their standing in the region, uh, and to give them perhaps a, a stronger domestic position in the ongoing civil war in Yemen. Greg, what about the part that Iran is playing in this conflict when it comes to the Houthis? How much support have they got? And are the Houthis acting on uh, under direct, uh, uh, let's say, instruction from Iran, or are they completely autonomous? They're receiving a lot of support, certainly, from Iran. If you look at the weapons that they've used over the past couple of months to attack these ships... Uh, they've used anti-ship missiles. Those were supplied by Iran. They have used drones that were supplied by Iran. Uh, much of the training that went into preparing for these attacks, that was taken care of by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Uh, and there was a ship, uh, an Iranian ship, which was believed to be a, a spy ship, an intelligence gathering ship uh, in the Red Sea. It left a few days ago before these strikes, but it had been in the Red Sea uh, passing intelligence to the Houthis about the movements of other vessels in the Red Sea. So there's a big Iranian role in, in training and preparing and facilitating these attacks. Whether Iran is ordering them, that is something that, that Yemenis and analysts have been debating for years, sort of the extent of the relationship between Iran and the Houthis. Is it a sort of proxy master relationship or uh, are they partners, but the Iranians don't always give orders? And I'm not sure there's a clear answer to that question, but it's also arguably moot at this point because they have a mutual interest uh, in trying to raise tensions in the Red Sea, trying to uh, drag America into a conflict there, trying to uh, impose costs on Israel. Uh, and so whether or not the Iranians are ordering it, uh, they are certainly happy that the Houthis are doing it and I think will we'll increase their support to the group in the, the weeks and months to come. And what about the role of Saudi Arabia? They have tried uh, to, um, well, to enforce 
their side when it comes to Yemen um, with uh, attacking the Houthis, uh, it, it, I think it was a year or so ago. But what about the role of Saudi Arabia? They've been seen as some somebody who in the region can uh, be the negotiator, for example, or trying to calm things down. We know that, for example, they've uh, been urging self-restraint uh, to avoid escalation. That's what they said on Friday. What is their role in this conflict? It's ironic because a few years ago, the Saudis would have been cheering Western That's strikes right. on the Houthis. Yeah. Uh, you had a, a Saudi-led coalition that invaded Yemen in 2015 uh, to try and remove the Houthis from power and restore the, the internationally recognized government uh, of Yemen. They have been fighting there ever since, although there has been a, a ceasefire in effect for uh, the past year and a half or so, and that has lowered violence between the, the coalition and the Houthis. Part of the reason there's this ceasefire in effect is because the Saudis have come to realize the war was a failure. Uh, they weren't able to remove the Houthis from power, uh, and they are desperate to get out of what has really become a quagmire for them over the past nine years. So whilst the Americans and the Brits are conducting strikes against their, their ostensible enemy in Yemen, uh, they are, as you say, calling for de-escalation, calling for calm, uh, because they're worried that this might jeopardize their efforts to strike a peace deal with the Houthis. And they're also worried that the Houthis might decide to escalate this campaign, not just attacking ships in the Red Sea, uh, but perhaps attacking targets in Saudi Arabia or in other countries in the Gulf, like the UAE. Uh, that's something they have done hundreds of times throughout the nine-year war. It had largely stopped over the past year or so. Uh, but there's a real concern uh, in Gulf countries that those attacks will restart now because the Houthis will want to lash out at their neighbors in the Gulf uh, to to retaliate, if you will, for this uh, American-led campaign. And finally, Greg, uh, I know you're speaking to us from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, we are seeing a huge pro-Palestinian march taking place in London today. We've also been told from the Palestinian health authorities that there have been uh, more casualties around 150 in the past uh, day. What is the atmosphere like in Israel at the moment and the continuation of the war? And more importantly, what do we know about the remaining hostages that are still being held by Hamas? The attitude towards the war is still broadly one of support and a, a desire to continue the war. There's been a lot of focus over the past couple of days here and elsewhere around the world uh, on this case before the, the International Court of Justice, uh, in which South Africa has accused Israel of uh, genocide in Gaza. And that's been discussed quite a lot here uh, since Thursday when the South Africans presented their case. Uh, but there's certainly no desire on the part of the Israeli government to end the war or change tactics. And uh, if there were a verdict that came down from the court finding that Israel had committed genocide, I don't think that would really lead to any uh, change on the part of the Israeli government. So uh, there is a sense that this is going to be a long war, as Israeli officials have said for, for many months now, and, and they're expecting this is something that will continue through 2024. The hostages, that remains, I think, the one point within Israeli society where uh, there is a point of disagreement about the war plans. You have a lot of people in Israel who want the war to continue as it has, but you have certainly the families of the hostages and, and people who support them uh, who want the Israeli government to agree to another ceasefire like the one it agreed to in November that uh, facilitated the release of about half of the hostages. Uh, it's thought that of the perhaps 130 who are still being held by Hamas, around 20 of them are already dead. Uh, there is an effort now to try and facilitate uh, shipments of medicine into Gaza to be delivered to the hostages because there are concerns about their their medical status and whether they're receiving medicine or medical care, which most people in Gaza uh, are not at the moment, Palestinian or Israeli. Uh, and there's a real concern that the longer this war drags on, uh, the, the greater the risk there is that many of these hostages will will not be returned alive.